Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by Fred and Lou Hartwig and viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics tonight. Continuing debate about a new convention hotel, the conventional battle about Republican philosophy in Kansas, and the battle for the Democratic presidential nomination in Las Vegas will place our bets, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker interview and welcome the director and CEO of Mid-Continent Public Library, Stephen Potter. Mid-Continent is celebrating its 50th anniversary early next month, and a variety of celebrations are planned. So let's learn about the library, the populations it serves, and how it has changed during its half century of service. Stephen Potter, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Well, you haven't been at the library all 50 years of its existence, <laughs> but you have been there for more than half, I think, that, and you've had a lot true. of different jobs. Th that is true. I actually started off, uh, I was going to school at UMKC, and I was looking for a part-time job, and they were running shift work in their catalog department, where the process and put the plastic covers on the books yeah. and, and all the barcodes. And I started off there, and that was in 1988, and I've pretty much been there ever since. Yeah, 27 and, years, I think I counted, yeah. 27 out of the 50. Done everything in between. There are lots of libraries in the metro Kansas City yeah. area. What distinguishes Mid-Continent? What sets it apart? Does it serve different populations? Well, it really does. Mid-Continent Public Library is a political subdivision of the state of Missouri. And, and we are chartered to operate in, in Clay, Platte, and Jackson counties. Uh, we have 700 and, about 780,000 people, which basically makes us the same size as the Kansas City Public Library and the Johnson County Library combined. Um, but one thing that I think is really important to understand is that even though there are separate libraries, and, and you know, our library serves people all the way north of the airport, all the way out to Lone Jack, and um, a, as well as you know, the Bannister Mall area and South Kansas City and all parts in between. Uh, so we're suburban, urban, exurban, and rural, but we all work together. In fact, I, I would suggest that the libraries in greater Kansas City are one of the great examples of regionalism and regional cooperation that you just don't find, you know, everywhere, okay. both sides of the state line, or um, uh, in the library community in general. Uh, you're the CEO, but you report to somebody. Uh, sure is there do. a governing board? Uh, yes, I have 12 bosses uh, and, and 700. Are they elected or appointed? Thousand bosses. Uh, they are appointed. They are appointed by the counties. So um, our current uh, board president is Trent Skaggs from Clay County. All right, you are celebrating the 50th anniversary, yes. and it's going to be a big celebration right. from what I've read. Talk a little bit about what's going on and what is planned. We really have been celebrating for quite a while now. We had a big family reunion, and we invited back everybody who's ever worked for Mid-Continent Public Library over 50 years. Uh, that was out at Arrowhead Stadium in May. Uh, we just had Gillian Flynn here to help us celebrate with our gala uh, about a week ago. And our big celebrations are our branch birthday parties. All 31 of our uh, branches are celebrating celebrating on our birthday, November the 10th, and you can just go to any of our uh, libraries. There's going to be all kinds of different celebrations, cake, balloons, uh, there's going to be small business celebrations because we do a lot of small business. Are you going outreach. to be at all of them? I, no, <laughs> <laughs> I can't make it. I've, I've tried to figure out how I can get, make it to all of them. I'll probably get about 20. Is of there them. a website people could check sure for the sure. individual locations and right. uh, exact times? Yeah, there, there sure is because there's about 85 celebrate, 31 locations, but 85 yeah. celebrations going on. And so you go to mymcpl.org/1965, and from the 1965 page, you can see all. You can see our history our celebrations, podcasts, timelines, all kinds of interesting things. You've got things. lots of interesting programs going on at Mid-Continent Library. Yeah. Talk about some that get particular attention from the public, and I was thinking of the Genealogy Center. The Midwest Genealogy Center is the largest public genealogy uh, library in the United States. The Mormon collection is a private collection, so ours is the largest public collection. And people come from all over the world, actually, to research. In fact, in some cases, you know, due to war and strife in Europe, uh, we have some records that are better 
in independence than they have in their home countries. So people come from all over to discover their families. Uh, as I mentioned, we do small business outreach, and in fact, we've actually launched, either launched or helped launch 45 small businesses this year through our small business outreach program and uh, our story center where we are helping people learn the art of storytelling whether it's written digital or oral storytelling and in fact we've actually published two books uh, this year uh, over the last 12 months uh, uh, Ed Matheny's uh, Cowtown was our first book that we published. Libraries have undergone massive changes in the yes. past half century uh, we're almost out of time but I assume we'll see tremendous change in the next 10, 20, 30 years? I would expect so. I mean, you know, the only constant is change, as, as they like to say. But I always like to view that as uh, as an opportunity. As the, as the changes come, as people ask us to do different things, then we will uh, view those uh, opportunities and, and we'll hopefully meet our public uh, where, where they are. All right. Happy anniversary. Thank you so much. That is Stephen Potter, director and CEO of the Mid-Continent Public Library. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. John Stevens is with Rock Hill Strategic, Ron Freeman is the former executive director of the Kansas GOP and is now a motivational speaker. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant and Crosby Kemper III is director of the Kansas City Library System and the host of KCPT's Emmy Award winning Meet the Past program now two years in a row. Congratulations to you and Thanks, the crew that put it together. Thank you. A Kansas City resident sent a letter to the Kansas City Star that was published on October the 9th. Charles Barnes asked a simple question. If the downtown hotel project is so good for the whole city, why won't they let us vote on it? That's essentially the same question being asked by the Citizens for Responsible Government organization that has collected enough signatures in a petition campaign to put the issue to a public vote. City says that can happen because contracts have already been signed for the project and cannot and should not be overturned by a vote. Now back to Mr. Barnes' question. If the downtown hotel project is so good for the city, why won't they let us vote on it? What would you tell Mr. Barnes? Well, I would tell him the reason the city doesn't want them to vote on it, citizens to vote on it, is because they know they'd lose. Uh, this is another one of these big boondoggle projects, which the city's using money from the library, the school district, the mental health levy, uh, community colleges to fund uh, something that has absolutely no reason for being. Uh, th this will not generate new conventions. We know that. Uh, the, our previous inv uh, investments in these, uh, our Las Vegas ballroom and the expansion of Bartle have not generated new conventions. It will not create jobs just like the other major investments we've made in recent years. We're not creating jobs, we're not creating economic development here, but we are, we are taking people's taxes to fund it, and that's wrong. And the voters know that, so they would vote against it. That's the reason. Let me ask John the same question for Mr. Barnes. If the downtown hotel project is so good for the city, why won't they let us vote on it? Well, I would ask the question of should every project that is great for the city or good for the city be a direct vote of, of the citizenry? Um, are we willing to move away from representative democracy in Kansas City? Do we no longer believe in that? And should we be moving to uh, referendums on, on everything? Besides, uh, this, is a, this is a signed contract. We would be setting a terrible precedent on this project. I think public debate on projects such as this hotel are, are very important. but. Um, a signed, approved contract, we would be setting a precedent that I think would hinder development and hinder projects for far into the future. Well, what about Crosby's point that this really won't generate economic development no. and won't bring conventions to Kansas City? Well, I, there, there is certainly, I think, debate on that, but the reality is we are seeing the benefits of tourism, and there are many experts that say that absolutely Kansas City has the majority of the, of the uh, venues in place to be very successful as a tourism uh, destination, and we're seeing that, and we need this development. So, but so, an 800 room hotel, how's that going to make it that much more attractive? <clears throat> Excuse me. You look at the situation, and you're trying to push something down the public throat, make them finance it, and do it without accountability. Oh, Ron, that's simply not the case. Well, it is. It all, it, first of all, before. John's correct. 
the contracts are already signed. This is pushed this by, has, this pushed has by has the been, mayor to be signed so that they couldn't a, be voted This is a project that has been worked on diligently years. by not years in the making. Behind the scenes. And uh, if it's I could just wrong. finish, Crosby, with my, the time allotted here, <laughs> please. And and to and to, I think that it's possible that the lawyers who who have looked at this think that this petition is illegal because you know there is a there is some, city lawyer, there is some uh, uh, a sense in which you can't go out and undo a contract under Missouri law, particularly one that's in the public sector. And the idea that there is no benefit to this, the land that the city is donating <laughs> to donating. this project, well, actually donating, currently has nothing on it. It brings in zero taxes. Because it's owned it by the city. It, well, that's the no, law. because of where it is and it's not useful no, or somebody would have it. Mary, that's there such is, nonsense. It's, could, it's, it's in the midst of immense amount of development. There's a 260 room hotel next door. There's a convention center next door. There's a performing arts center, which costs $300 million next door. It is a, a, a parcel of land on which nothing sits. Well, well, the idea that we're stealing from the library in order to build a hotel yeah, there is should simply be taxes not an paid on that. There should be taxes paid on that Crosby, land. what are the consequences if the city can't fulfill the contract and the city has to spend unlimited amounts of money because of a failed contract, that's money wasted. Well, well, one money of the wasted. things we don't know about this deal is the contract with the catering contract, which seems to actually open the city up to uh, unlimited spending uh, if they don't meet their numbers. And the numbers are crazy. I mean, the HVS uh, the study is now out that the, the city hid from us uh, uh, until now. And, and, and it shows that for the numbers to work on this, we have to increase somewhere between 60 and 70 percent the total amount of convention business. Over, after spending $300 million on, on, the, on the convention center uh, over, the, over the last 15 years, we increased the, the number of room nights by two-tenths of a percent on average from 2002 to 2013. This is, it's all ridiculous. It's not going to well, happen. Well, according to Steve Rose, if you want to oh do, do business in this city by referendum, Feel free, but we would never I, I just don't have want to do the deal because it's a bad deal. It's a bad deal for the library, for, and for the school district. Let, let me read you what, what, what Steve Rose said, and I know you and Steve are so often in agreement, Crosby. No. Uh, <laughs> people are being presented with a false choice. This is not about economic development versus the rights of the people. This is about the rule of law and the ability of elected officials absolutely. to conduct business yes. on behalf of the city. You agree? That, absolutely. Yes. Even I would agree with that. Even That's you would agree. You know, well, I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know about that. Project. Project. Specific question about, about the uh, about the referendum. What I do know is they did all the negotiating behind the scenes. Yeah. They wouldn't release the consultants. And it was rushed through the city after, council until after they signed the contract, yeah. uh, and they did it on, on the emergency okay. measure. Okay, no, that the city got, does everything. Got to go on. The conservative and moderate wings of the Republican Party have been fighting since the party was born in the Civil War era. In Kansas at the moment, the conservative wing is in control, thanks to Governor Sam Brownback now serving his second term with a strong majority of like-minded Republicans in the legislature. But some moderate Republicans are speaking out and vowing to run against conservative incumbents next year. One is Dinah Sykes, who is planning a campaign against Johnson County State Senator Greg Smith. Ms. Sykes says her views are shared by many friends and potential constituents. We love our parks, we love our libraries, we love our good roads, we love our schools. We can't keep allowing this attack on our children and our schools. From your unique perspective as a former party official in Kansas, Ron, do you see a growing moderate trend among Kansas Republicans? No, I think it's been that same same song, different verse. You've got people who've been at each other's throat for a long time. I think you saw in 2014, <clears throat> excuse me, the limits of the moderates. I mean, you saw them get behind the candidate to oppose Sam Brownback, everything, invested millions, uh, worked hard for the candidates, and they lost. I don't, excuse me, I don't think it's going to be any different this time. I mean, you might win a state senate race here or there, but you're not going to alter the political well, landscape. Well, let me ask you something, Ron. How do we define a Republican moderate in Kansas? You know what? That is a really tricky question. I, you know, well, the, the, the missing the, person. Is, is that, I, I'm not a conservative. That's what it is. I mean, is I mean, it a it pragmatic conservative, somebody who may be conservative in his political orientation or her political orientation, but will make a deal, will compromise on certain things? Well, you know what? And I don't know that that's the case. I think what you have is it really is personal. 
And I think oh, there's this right. concept well, where there, there has to be some <laughs> distinction between a conservative yeah. when you, when and a moderate. Look, look, look at Republican who spends money. Yeah. Well, moderate, look at lots yeah. moderate yeah. Republicans well, have in, in Kansas. Uh, <coughs> but Kansas has always been viewed as a moderate state ever since the, you know they <laughs> they didn't take to slavery as much as Missouri did. Mm -hmm. um, and so moderation and Republicans. But what is, what is a moderate right. platform? Well, well, that's the question. Well, well, it's it's very clear. In the Republicans core of it, Ron, is one thing, and that is that every child and every person in the state of Kansas has a right to an excellent public education. That is the, that is the core issue around which moderate Conservatives believe that too. We want absolutely. No, absolutely. No, no, you want to privatize <laughs> public education. Let me finish. No, the, I don't. the moderates in the Republican Party don't have a party anymore. That's that's the truth. Sam Brownback has complete control over the state government except the judiciary. But, but isn't that the party. moderates' fault? For not campaigning, for not getting the people well, out to I the polls. Well, I think they took uh, the far I, I mean, right and the Tea Party for granted well, me, for a long time. They for took years, their power for, for granted. For years, it seems to me it's that moderates in, can, right, moderates, in, yeah. on, moderates in Kansas complain and they don't campaign. <laughs> and now maybe they're going to campaign. Here's what they don't do. They don't vote in primaries. Right. And uh, for some, well, this is, let's, this they don't win elections. This is some some of my best friends are in Republicans who lose in Kansas. Kansas. I, I think Democratic it's also party. important. <laughs> let's let's bring this conservative versus moderate back to Kansas. All right. The current state of Kansas, the conservative, it is it is ideology over logic right now, and that's where you're seeing some of this bubbling of, of the moderate push. I agree with Ron. They're not organized. The, the moderate wing, it, as such, is not organized. So what they need to do is they do need to organize, and I don't know that they're going to be able to unless we are going to see in this next session there will have to be cuts. There will be no appetite for tax increases. There will be no appetite for other f increases. There will be massive cuts. That may allow the moderate wing Is that to what's going to energize moderates well, and give them a chance? If they have to cut vote. another 100, 200, 300 million dollars after, after all the things they did last year where uh, um, you know, even even conservatives were saying this was not the right approach. And, and tax collection has not been Steve what had been forecast. Well, Is that not right? The, I, ta the tax revenues in Kansas have not been as high as originally forecast. Oh, the tax revenues are off far. sharply so, by so millions. Ron, <laughs> Yeah. How do we know a Democratic moderate? How is a moderate Democrat different from a Republican moderate? Yeah, or are I, they just the same? I don't think, again, that's you can't yeah, define it. What is a well, moderate? You, you have to be able to define it, otherwise, no, no, no. why do you use the term? <laughs> exactly. How do you, you know, know, how do you know no. uh, Republicans <laughs> not a conservative? Yeah, that's, how do you that's, that's the whole the point. I'm a moderate, what does that mean? I'm, I'm left to center. Right. There, are, there are no Democratic moderates. I mean, you know, every, everybody <laughs> agrees with Bernie Sanders, you know? That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> we'll get to that in the next question, well, we, we, we But no, that, that's the no, whole thing about being a moderate. You don't have to find yourself. The Democratic Party in Kansas exists, but barely. It used to be bigger than it is because there were Southern Democrats, something called Southern Democrats that were also in the party. But moderate Republicans will not become Democrats currently. They just can't bring themselves to do that. So they want to take their party back and be the conservative party. Right. Sam Brownback is not the conservative. Look, the, the He's the divide, radical. The divide is on both sides. Uh, the right. radical we'll, right wing we'll, leader we'll, of we'll, an we'll, insurgency. We'll see about a year from now how <laughs> things are. <laughs> yeah. It was a roll of the dice for five candidates seeking the presidential nomination as they turned out for the first Democratic debate in the nation's gaming capital, Las Vegas, Nevada. Notably absent was Vice President Joe Biden, who has yet to decide if he's going to run. Much of the attention was focused on frontrunner Hillary Clinton, still immersed in the email and Benghazi controversies. City is basically an arm of the Republican National Committee. It is a partisan vehicle as admitted by the House Republican Majority Leader, Mr. McCarthy, uh, to drive down my poll numbers, big surprise. And that's what they have attempted to do. I am still standing. Other Democratic candidates standing on stage were Senator Bernie Sanders, former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley, former Navy Secretary and U.S. Senator Jim Webb, and former Rhode Island Governor and Senator Lincoln Chafee. This was Hillary's first debate since the 2008 presidential campaign. How did she do, Mary? Well, because I have an intense interest in public presentations, <laughs> what I do and have most of my adult life, I, I watched her with as much um, 
Objectivity? Objectivity as I could bring to it, because I'm such a strong supporter of hers. <coughs> but I was just really overwhelmed with the excellence of her performance. She, she did three things. It was a powerful statement of her personal political identity. It was delivered with grace and intelligence and with really, um, I don't know to call it the unity of the message with the messenger. Hillary was relaxed and smart and assertive when she had to and gracious and shook hands with Bernie and also took on her opponents in the United States Congress on the so-called Benghazi Committee with, with real out, outstanding I, I would say that not just Democrats applauded her performance. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of conservatives right. said she easily won the debate. Charles Krauthammer and Mike, said the, she's the nominee of the party unless she's indicted. Here's right. one of the reasons why. She delivered her practice lines. Everybody knows who works on speeches that, you re, uh, that the, the, uh, the power of preparation gives you a presence. It relaxes you so much that you could deliver your lines. She delivered the line about, I am a progressive, but I'm a progressive that wants to get things done. I know how to find common ground, and I know how to stand my ground. Now, obviously, a practice line, but delivered it with, with ease and a certain elegance. Hillary got some, some help from her <laughs> primary uh, opponent, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, when he complained about the email questions and no doubt scored the biggest moment of the evening. Let me say something that may not be great politics, but I think the secretary is right. And that is that the American people are sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails. Thank you. Me too. Me too. <laughs> you know? Sanders and the Democratic audience may be tired of the email question, Crosby, but the rest of America well, is you know, not tired of it. Yeah, and the fact that you know the Russians, the Chinese, and, and probably teenagers in Olathe are reading those emails because it's so easy to hack because the server was in a bathroom in Denver. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the emails will surface again. But the real problem for Hillary Clinton uh, is is precisely why she won the debate, the Democratic debate, is she endorsed President Obama's incredibly failed uh, foreign policy in the same week that Vladimir Putin was making fools of us, and and he and, and he announced that our Afghanistan policy. Policy yep. has failed, uh, and and she also endorsed every big spending idea that uh, Bernie Sanders has ever invented or the Swedes ever thought of. Uh, you know, expansion of Medicare, free college, free college. No, that's I, actually I think the not highlight true. Was when, we, when, we, when, we, when we learned. She it back. No, that's actually yeah. not no. true. Well, I thought it was amusing when Anderson Cooper, the master of ceremonies, the moderator, who I think did a very good well, job, yes, he when he said good. Sanders spent his honeymoon in Moscow. In Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you know, to Crosby's point, when Bernie was saying, describing for the audience what a democratic socialist is, Hillary t said, here, hey, I know I'm not, I'm not somebody who thinks that we ought to imitate Denmark. I love Denmark, but this is the United right. States of America, right, and I am yeah. different we're, we're from him get, on this economic this policy. What about these three secondary <laughs> candidates who were on stage, sure, Webb, <laughs> O'Malley, and sure. Chafee? There's Weren't they all quite disappointing? I, yeah, I, th I think so. I, I, as as Mary said, Hillary looked very very presidential. She did everything she needed to do in this debate. Uh, Bernie Sanders energizes the base. He gets and apparently got a lot of uh, extra money as a result of he his did. debate he appearance. Did, you know, and I think he energizes the base. And O'Malley, I thought looked. Rather vice presidential, mm -hmm. uh, Chafee, yeah. uh, Chafee and Webb well, Chafee needs uh, to go were, were non factors. To Rhode Island and, I mean, and stay there. They, they were non factors, but the advantage the Democrats had there was there were only five versus this giant cavalcade of people uh, mm -hmm. at the Republican debate. Was this debate too long, Ron? I don't think it was too long. I think what you had was Hillary and her props. I mean, that's, she's going to be court, she's going to be the, she's right. going to be our nominee. I mean, <laughs> okay. That's what's going it on. It is time now. Make her look time now for roast and toast, where the Ruckettes fling grenades or accolades at people and events. In the news, and we start this time with Crosby. So Bob Lighton came to the uh, library. Great economist, great man, former vice president at the Kauffman Foundation, 40 years uh, at the Brookings Foundation. On the day Brookings fired him because of a four-page letter from Elizabeth Warren objecting to the research that he'd done uh, on uh, a, a rule uh, that she was proposing uh, from the CPFB. Uh, Brookings gave in uh, to Elizabeth Warren and fired him. Uh, a, a, t a roast uh, to Senator Elizabeth Warren and to Strobe Talbot and the Brookings Institution uh, for an extraordinary malfeasance. John. 
My toast is for city, state, and healthcare officials for their announcement of a mental health care triage facility at 12th and Prospect. It, Kansas City, like m much of the nation, is facing a uh, challenges of crime, challenges of homelessness, uh, challenges of uh, health care, and a mental health care triage facility uh, ultimately is one of the best steps we could take in Kansas City to address many of the issues we're facing. Mary. Well, it's been so exciting. I mean, the Kansas City Royals, how can I toast you <coughs> enough? Uh, only by saying <clears throat> that for days and days now, the center of this city is home plate at Kauffman Stadium. And um, I try to pick four words that I think describe you. You have strength, you have style, you have grace, and you have power, all at the same time. And your commitment to excellence is a lesson for all of us, no matter what we're, our ages or our inclination to like the sport. But I love your sport, and I love the joy with which you play it. Thank you. Ron. To continue on the Royal steam, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Johnny Cueto, who's had an up and down Absolutely. time here, but uh, you stood on the mound last night and you got it done. Uh, you retired 19 guys, <coughs> guys in a row, a very good Houston Astros team, and, and obviously got the Royals where they wanted to be, which is why you were brought here. Congratulations. Great job. And finally, staying in the presidential campaign mode, here's a toast to comic Jay Leno, who's still producing great one-liners even after leaving The Tonight Show, says Jay. Do you realize that if Bernie Sanders wins the election, it will be the first time Americans have elected a socialist as president since 2008? And that's <laughs> Ruckus for this week. We're back Sunday morning at 1130, then next Thursday evening at 7. Now on behalf of the Ruckettes and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.